Bodily Function Control Bodily function control is a city. It describes the ability of a person to control the functions of their own autonomic system. Thus they can control pain and thus negate pain messages coming to the conscious mind. As well as slow their breathing, slow their heartbeat, slow the digestive processes and the evacuation processes. In effect, they can control every function of each organ. The heat of the mystic is just one example of this capability. The culmination of control may be a form of suspended animation in which the person controls the slowing or suspension of the functions of life without death itself occurring. A person himself or herself, though it is usually a him, is in total control of the process. The people we have chosen for this video all survived without any long-term damage being done. Surviving being shot by a gun having a hand eaten by ants, having a knife plunged into your chest, carrying a pot of burning embers. Some of these accounts have been abridged slightly, but the full versions are on our website. They are all fact not fiction. And as you can see from the photos and paintings, many more examples exist. Being shot. Indian Stories was written by Major Cicero Newell, 1840 to 1913. It was published in 1912. The interpreter said that the people always wanted to see the holy men tested before they accepted them for teachers. If the men were frauds, they would be killed, but if they were really holy men, they would come out of the test alive and unharmed. I found over 1,000 men with their families gathered in a semicircle behind the warehouse to witness the test. Opposite the semicircle was a gently sloping hill. The semicircle of the Indians was about 200 feet in diameter. In the centre, between the Indians and the hill, stood an old warrior. He had a Winchester rifle. Around his waist was a belt which was filled with Winchester rifle cartridges. He loaded his gun and stood ready to shoot. When everything was ready, I saw two Indians come out of a teepee just outside the circle. I was told by the interpreter that these men had not tasted food for nearly 48 hours. They had been praying to the Great Spirit night and day asking to be protected from all harm. They wore no clothing except the breech cloth which all Indians then wore around their loins. Their bodies were painted red. As they entered the circle of Indians, the two men began to run at a slow dog trot, one running behind the other. As they passed, the old warrior raised his rifle and fired a shot at the leading Indian. I watched very carefully to see if the ball missed its mark. 
If the ball passed the Indian, it would surely strike the hillside, and I would see the dust which it raised. I was certain that it did not strike the hillside or the ground. It could not pass over the hill. It was aimed too low. I had served in the army four years, where I had often heard the ping of rifle balls, and I was convinced that I heard that same unpleasant sound on this occasion. Each time, after the Indians had passed him and he had fired the shot, the old warrior advanced, picked up something from the ground and placed what he had found in a leather pocket he had on his belt. The old warrior fired six shots at each Indian reloading his gun after the chamber was emptied. After the shooting was ended, the two Indians went to their teepee, where food was ready for them. I called the old warrior to me and asked him to let me see what he had in his pouch. He handed me five of the rifle balls that he took from the pocket. They all showed the marks of the groove of the gun and the points were slightly flattened. I saw paint on some of the balls. The interpreter informed me that the balls hit the sides of the Indians and fell harmless to the ground, taking with them some of the paint which was on the skin of the Indians. I asked the old warrior how the trick was done. I shall never forget the look he gave me. It was not a look of contempt, but one of pity, that I could be so ignorant as to believe that he would practice fraud. Being eaten by ants. The next example is taken from a book by Paul Brunton, and is a word for word extract from a report in a newspaper printed in India in 1935. The report describes a yogi in Rishikesh, the sacred place of pilgrimage near Hardwar in Dehradun district. It describes the removal of the emaciated body of a young Hindu yogi from a tomb in the presence of thousands of spectators from Paul Brinton, The Quest of the Oversouth. On October the 10th, 1935, he entered the trance in the hollow Masonic structure, measuring hardly 16 square feet and about four or five feet high. The entrance to it was closed with a stone, which was cemented as soon as the yogi entered it. A guard was posted at the place to keep watch on him. He was then walled up in his living tomb and for six weeks great crowds of Hindus reverently waited while he performed this, the supreme penance. All during the period he took neither food nor water. On entering the tomb the yogi left instructions that on the 45th day after he entered it, between 7 and 10 a.m., they should take him out and massage his body with oil. This is the third time that the yogi has taken the trance experience. In the first trance, one of his hands was partially eaten away by ants. Having a knife stuck in your chest. Tara Bay was an exceptionally accomplished magician, and we have an entry on our website providing more examples of his accomplishments. Dr. Paul Brenton, 1936, A Search in Secret Egypt. Tara Bay permitted a large, sharp knife to be stuck into his chest and then withdrawn. 
The wound was bloodless. A doctor expressed a wish to see the blood flow to assure himself that the faker had really been wounded. Immediately, the latter caused the red fluid to stream out until it inundated his chest. A rather ghastly sight. When the doctor was satisfied, the Egyptian stopped all flow of blood by mere willpower. Ten minutes later, the wound had practically healed. One of the assistants produced a flaming torch and passed it along the entire length of the faker's left leg, as high as the middle of his thigh. We heard the skin and flesh crackle slightly in the heat, yet his face remained serene, unmoved, entirely undisturbed. Another doctor, still unconvinced, believing that Tara Bay had secretly taken some powerful drug, tested the man's heartbeats whilst the flame was being applied. They did not register the slightest change. Had he suffered any pain and masked it, or even mastered it by a phenomenally strong will, the heart would of course have vastly accelerated its beats. His face would have turned pale and other signs would have presented the evidence of his secret suffering. Moreover, had he taken a drug, his breathing would no longer have remained normal, which was certainly the case with him now. Carrying a pot of burning embers We now turn from India to Africa and a book by Kariamu Waish Asanti called African Dance. One of the essays in this book describes the efficacy of frenetic dancing as a means of achieving a trance state. A trance state in which seemingly impossible feats can be achieved. Omo Folabo Soyinka Ajaya The Dynamics of African Religious Dances Dance is undoubtedly a vital means of communicating with the sacred in African religious practices. It is an expressive form fully integrated within the worship system. The anchor point of communication is that area of liminality where the ephemeral nature of dance fuses with transcendental powers. This is the high point of worship. It is perhaps for this reason the ability to cross over to the beyond and establish communication between God and man that some cultures regard dance as a sacred art. The transcendental dance can be performed by any of the devotees, but quite often a religious body may find it expedient to have an individual or a group of people specially anointed to be the dance medium between the two worlds. Such mediums are given special titles among the Yoruba people of Nigeria, for example, they are generally referred to as Ayawo, Elegant or Isin Orissa. They are believed to be specially chosen by the deity itself, either from birth or later in life, through frequent and often unprovoked possession by the spirit of the deity. The medium becomes imbued with the superhuman qualities and is able to see visions or perform extraordinary feats usually described as magic. During possession, which in some cases may last from anywhere between five minutes to seven days, the medium is impervious to normal human emotions and sensations, especially pain, hunger, and thirst. One of the supernatural acts 
perform during possession is to dance carrying a pot of live embers pierced at the bottom. <laughs>